In this module, we explore the whole issue of measures and measuring performance against the requirements of the care and growth leadership model. Now, in a sense, fundamentally, one measures in order to measure how one succeeds. And we did indicate before that the success of an enterprise is really based on the degree to which it produces a surplus. And a surplus is the direct measure of the degree to which the individual in the organization gave more than what he took. We had the three bakers example, if where Sally, Vusi and Krishna worked together to produce a cake. And at the end of the month, the cake was sold. And what was left was the surplus. And that surplus only exists because the total cake that was baked was bigger than what each individual took home. In other words, successful enterprises are based on people who are giving more than what they're taking. The question is, how does one measure the business in such a way to enable people to have this attitude of being able to give more than what they take? From that point of view, I think it's important to bear the following in mind. In the first instance, people don't go the extra mile for owners. When we looked at the issue of the whole problem of the benevolent intent of the enterprise and phrasing benevolent intent, we said, for example, that if you tell people they should work very hard because they'll make shareholders rich, they'll probably get very annoyed. Whereas if you ask people to work very hard because what they do makes a valuable contribution to their customers and clients, they become far more willing to contribute. Which means that if you only construct your measures on the basis of what's good for the shareholder, you're unlikely to solicit contributory behavior. The second thing that's true is how you measure a game affects the, how the game is played. Uh, for example, if you, in the game of rugby, if, if six points were rewarded for a drop goal and three points were rewarded for a, a try, you'd have a very different game. <coughs> Further to this, if you want to solicit contribution, then you must measure contribution. And finally, the only accounting statement that actually measures contribution is the value added statement. Most businesses account for themselves uh, on the basis of either a profit or loss account or an income statement. And really the income statement is skewed to make the whole point of the process, the bottom line, if you like, of what's good for the shareholder. The value added statement enables a different way of looking at the numbers. So, for example, if you say, well, how do we add value? Uh, the, the process of adding value is the oldest economic principle known to man. It happened even before we, we started counting the value of things in cowrie shells. For example, let's say a Neanderthal uh, collects a stick, a stone, and some string, which he does something to, and then he produces an axe. Now, clearly, the, the difference between the axe and the stick and the stone and the string is the value that the Neanderthal added. And what he adds to the stick and the stone and the string to produce the axe is his effort, his time, and his intelligence. So in a sense, those are the three ways that we can add value. And the next question is, well, can one measure that adding of value? And yes, we can. Let's say you're dealing with a little old lady who buys a ball of wool and some knitting needles that she does something to, and she produces a very nice jumper. If the little old lady gets paid a thousand dollars or rand for her jumper, and she paid five hundred dollars or rand for the needles in the wool, clearly she's added five hundred rands worth of value, which suggests that value added is the accounting measure of the value of her personal contribution, and it actually is constituted by the difference between the turnover, which is what your customer has rewarded you for your service to the customer, and costs paid to outside suppliers. You're therefore accounting for the labor of the little old lady in the value-added column. And it suggests you're no longer viewing her as a cost. Now this is very important because what the value-added statement therefore does is it allows you to view people as part of the contributory side of the enterprise, not on the cost side. I mean, fundamentally, you're trying to get people to make a contribution to the business, and then you call them costs. You know, so you're saying to the person, you're a cost on my business, you're something that needs to be minimized, you're something that needs to be cut down. Now, that doesn't solicit the intent to contribute. So the question is, well, how does one measure value added in a, in a business? And in the first instance, value added is the difference between the turnover 
and outside costs paid to outside suppliers, bearing in mind you're not accounting for labor in this category. So if we assume that we're dealing with an average manufacturing enterprise in this country, in South Africa, the value added that most enterprises produce is normally about half of the turnover. In other words, it's about the same as outside costs. The question is, who all participates in that value added? Who gets what of it? And by far the lion's share goes to employees. It's perfectly legitimate that employees should get the lion's share of value added because they, after all, are the ones adding the value. The next thing that money gets spent on is reserves. And reserves accounts for uh, around 20% of value added, in other words, 10% of the turnover. Now, although technically and legally the reserves belong to shareholders, the question is who all has an interest in the reserves of the business? And in order to answer that, we need to understand what reserves are there for. The reserves really are the savings of the company, which enable the, the company to be able to continue trading in the future. So we indicated that these numbers are typical for a manufacturing concern. So this is the capital that the manufacturing concern would re retain in order to do things like buy more plant. Now, if we assume that what the business is doing is actually useful to customers, then those reserves aren't just in the shareholder's interest, they're in the customer's interest, because it's in the customer's interest for their business to continue trading. It's also obviously in the employee's interest, because you don't want to work for a business that has so little faith in its future that it doesn't invest in itself. The next account, if you like, that gets addressed in, from uh, the wealth distribution side of the value added statement is tax. And ostensibly, it's appropriate to view the value added statement as part of the wealth distribution side of this uh, of the statement, because tax gives a, pays the state uh, the funds required to help us with an infrastructure within which we can trade. And then finally, there's the dividend, which is purely the preserve of the shareholder. Now that suggests that the value added statement therefore articulates in two pieces. There's a piece that's concerned with wealth creation and there's a piece that's concerned with wealth distribution. The aim of enterprise is to serve customers. In other words, the aim of enterprise is the creation of wealth. It's the top end of the value added statement. Wealth distribution is the means to ensure the ongoing creation of wealth. In other words, we don't distribute wealth. Uh, I mean, the aim of the enterprise isn't to distribute wealth, to pay employees or indeed to enrich shareholders. Employees, um, the company reserves, the, share, the shareholder and the taxman all cooperate in such a way as to create wealth. In other words, the wealth distribution part of our uh, wealth value added statement is actually the means piece and the end piece is the wealth creation part. Now, the first thing that is visually uh, interesting about how the value added statement operates is that clearly we're accounting for employees on the same side of the fence as shareholders. And that's very important because it's high time that we start seeing that shareholders and employees have got far more in common with each other than what they have uh, against each other. If we make the shareholder the principal aim of, of all of this, in, this, this activity, the only variable that's, that's solely in the interest of the shareholder is the dividend. So therefore, if you say that enterprises exist to enrich uh, owners, you're really arguing that the, the smallest element of value added is the reason for the existence of the enterprise. Now, that's just fundamentally illogical. En enterprises exist to serve customers and clients. They're there to add value. Employees, the state, the, uh, the sh and shareholders cooperate and collude in such a way as to enable them to add that value. You could, if you try and make the point of the enterprise purely just the interests of the shareholder, you could actually say, but you know, you can make a far stronger point that, act, that the aim of the enterprise is to provide employment. Because after all, far more money gets spent out of the wealth distribution piece on employees than any other single variable. You could also say, on the other hand, that actually the key is reserves. Um, uh, the Methvin family, for instance, when they ran Rainbow Chickens, 
literally used to use the, uh, the, the reserves of the company as a method to save for the family. So they used to buy enormously expensive works of art and hang them all over the business. You could also say, arguably, that the reason for the business existing is to provide the, uh, the state with a fiscal base. So, in a sense, it's, it's, it's absolutely arbitrary to decide that the point of the business is the shareholder and that the smallest element of value added, which is the dividend which is provided to the shareholder, is the aim of the business. It makes far more sense to say we're here to add value. Now, finally, what the value added statement allows you to do, therefore, is it allows you to account for the business on an ongoing basis in such a way that employees experience themselves to be on the same side of the fence as the owner, so that there isn't a hostility between employees and owners. The, the, the deepest implication of this is the following. The value added it provides us a superordinate goal, something which is bigger than the interests of either employees and owners, something which gives each party then a reason to contribute, because you only contribute for something which is bigger than your own interests. As soon as you make the point of the enterprise, the interests, the peculiar interests of any one of the individuals in the enterprise, either the employee or the owner, you set up a competitiveness which then, then which shifts the debate, not from how much value have you added, in other words, how big can we bake this cake, but to rather who's getting what slice of the cake. Now, bearing that in mind and bearing the distinction between the wealth creation and the wealth distribution parts of the value-added statement in mind, what next becomes apparent is that you can use the value-added statement as a spine for both your employee reporting and your management reporting. And in fact, you can put it, use it in such a way that it gives each person in the business a real understanding of how they personally contribute to the business. So again, if we consider that we're dealing with a manufacturing concern, then if we, one communicated the financial performance of the business to every work team consistent with a value-added statement, the next thing you could do, you could also give each work team an understanding of how they contribute to that value-added statement. For instance, they would be doing things on a day-to-day -day basis that would affect the turnover of the company because they would either be doing things that affect the quality of the product or they'd be doing things that affect the volume. The second thing that they'd be doing is that they'd be doing things that would affect outside costs, either by uh, pr uh, producing waste or by producing things like unplanned maintenance. The next thing you can do is you can give people an understanding of the purpose of the wealth distribution uh, of the business. You would therefore indicate to people, for instance, how um, what was paid to employees, how much of that was concerned with bonus pay payments. In the case of reserves, you can indicate to people what the upcoming capital projects are in the business. From a tax point of view, you can help explain how that tax gets used by pointing out, for example, local infrastructure development and how that affects the business. And then finally, and lastly, you can also tell employees about what's, uh, what was in it for the shareholders and how we have actually adequately rewarded the shareholder or not adequately rewarded the shareholder for having taken a risk with us to put us in the position to add value. In other words, you can account for the business in a holistic way, in a way which employees don't see the interests of the, ho of the shareholder as hostile to their own interests. Now, a final point I'd like to make about this is that we're arguing that the value-added statement should not just be used as a mechanism for employee reporting. That was very much the case in South Africa in the 80s, and actually the intent of that was purely manipulating. It was in order for employees not to see the interests of owners as hostile to them. What we're arguing currently is that the value-added statement should also be used as a spine for your management reports, because it creates a bias in the eye of the manager. He's not looking at purely what's in the interests of the shareholder and putting everybody else against that interest. So, for example, when the business is in trouble, he doesn't immediately want to cut to employees. He's rather not saying, how can we distribute less cake to employees and more cake to the shareholder? He's saying, how can we bake a bigger cake?